Okay, well, let's kick it off. Welcome, everybody, to our Women Caring for the Land webinar hosted by our Moses in Her Boots project. Thank you so much for joining us in the virtual space. My name is Lisa Kivris. I'm a was farmer here in southern Wisconsin and also have the honor of working with Moses now for over 10 years on our In Her Boots project doing outreach to women farmers and landowners and this session in particular kicks off our our virtual space here of connecting under a, a wider tent to more people and keeping things safe and healthy and granted different this summer because usually yes we're meeting together but this gives us opportunity to bring in more people bring in a fabulous panel of women experts in the landowner ski place and answer questions, share resources, et cetera, on how we as a community of women can better steward our land. So I'm gonna do a couple quick slides here to kick us off and give us some overviews and then turn things over to our expert panel here. And we will be using the chat function for this webinar so you'll see as we move along please uh, jump into the chat and introduce yourself and introduce your organization your farm ask questions and we will use that to curate as we go and a, a shout out to stephanie kaufman at the moses office in spring valley who is the the the, the wheels behind all of this and making it work and uh, bringing us all together virtually and and actually putting the slides for me together and making them go. So Steph, we're ready, so we can roll. All right. All right, and it's, uh, thank you to Gemplers, who is our sponsor and helping bring all these pieces together today and is a wonderful supporter of Moses and our organic farming community. So a little bit about Moses, because one thing we, we started with this webinar and we historically have done our women landowner training in my state here of Wisconsin where Moses is based and we were planning to do some sessions in person this spring and when that detoured we started thinking let's do this virtually and then this evolved and some other resources I'll talk about but we also realized that the tent will be much wider and welcome to people who have called in and zoomed in from places other than Wisconsin. We want to share our resources today from a more national lens, but also dial into specific resources that we're familiar with here in Wisconsin and the Midwest and hopefully connect some new people. So first off, speaking of the Midwest, MOSES, the Midwest Organic Sustainable Education Service. Hopefully folks are familiar with MOSES, but for new people, a warm welcome. We are the, the hub, the mothership for organic farming information here in the Midwest and a national leader in our organic farming movement. We are most known for our organic farming conference, which happens every February in La Crosse. It's the largest organic farming conference gathering, as we like to call it, in the known universe. So if that has not been on your radar, a very warm welcome to come to Wisconsin in February. It's, it's a warm-hearted crowd, I trust you. Trust me. And we also do a variety of field days in the field, all of which are also virtual this summer, and we'll send you some more information on that, all of which lives on the mosesorganic.org site. There are also a variety of organic specialists on staff at Moses, so pick up the good old phone and talk to a live person with questions and get answers on organic farming and related practices. A lot of free publications, including the very good guidebook for organic certification for anyone who might be dabbling into that for the first time. And then a variety of other projects, a great farmer to farmer mentoring program, matching farmers with seasoned farmers for education and advice, the In Her Boots project that I run where we have a variety of resources throughout the year for women farmers, women landowners, very much based on collaboration and connecting us and sharing of resources. We have our, also our In Her Boots podcast and a new podcast from Moses, more general, the organic farming podcast and more. So that's a little bit on Moses to kick us off, but thank you again for joining us today. And a couple tips on Zoom, which trust me, I am new to, <laughs> and uh, we all are navigating, but uh, kudos to those who are savvy, and we really would appreciate your feedback. We'll send out a survey after the webinar on how we can better navigate this virtual space, particularly for those folks like myself who are in rural areas with, uh, let's just say, unreliable, if not particularly zippy internet, and how we can make things most accessible. But for right now, for folks who wonderfully have signed on, you'll notice in the participant tab, 
uh, on um, on the screen there, it uh, there is a rename function, so you can do that and then tell us your name and where you live and add a little a little personality to our session here. And then again, as I was mentioning, please use the chat function to ask questions as we roll. And basically, everybody except the people speaking will be muted, so we can keep keep noise control, keep things rolling. And then when we do the a more Q&A towards the end. Again, if folks have some more detailed questions and want to chat more, we're happy to do that, and we can unmute you at that time. Thank you. And thanks again to this wonderful host of organizations and women you will meet shortly here who have joined us today, the Driftless Area Land Conservancy, the National Resources Conservation Service, and Pheasants Forever in partnership with Moses. As you can sense, women are a collaborative bunch, <laughs> and I don't think I've ever been involved with any women landowner, women farmer event in our community here that has been one organization. We are always, when there's more we can bring to the party, we are happy to do that, and thank you for everybody's contributions. So, a big thank you again to our panelists. As I was mentioning, this program, this webinar birthed and is housed currently coming to you live from my home state of Wisconsin. And we want to share resources and keep things broader to hopefully help the women calling in from across the country. But I want to give a shout out and a appreciation to my home state of Wisconsin because we have so many amazing women here that are driving our conservation movement, our land conservation education and outreach, and particularly amongst women, I'm really fortunate to be working with an incredible group of friends and colleagues here where we're all on the same page of the more we can support women, the more land we can get in conservation practices via women, the world will be a better place. So I wanted to first kick things off with Angela Biggs, who is our head person here in Wisconsin, our state conservationist for NRCS. And truly, if we could clone Angela for the rest of the country and the rest of 50 states, we would be a better place because she is an amazing leader for our state NRCS, but particularly for women and any and every opportunity she has to participate in things like this. She always says enthusiastically yes and helps us as women navigate the many multiple programs of NRCS because historically, we have not been as, as represented uh, in these programs, and Angela's a real champion to change that. So thank you, and we will move to Angela. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, pleasure to be here with you all um, in this unique environment. I am used to the face-to-face -face meetings, but I've become, over the last several months, uh, quite expert, I think. Well, I wouldn't call me an expert, but definitely more used to doing all of these video meetings. Uh, so hopefully everybody can see my slide. Um, again, Angela Biggs, I am the state conservationist here in Wisconsin for the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and we are one of the agencies under the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, we have a state conservationist in every state out there, and then also for the territories, um, <clears throat> and we have offices across the country. And so I'm going to just walk you through a little bit um, about NRCS, who we are, and what, we, what services we provide. Um, but just a little bit about me before I do get started with uh, the agency. Um, so I am born and raised between the Midwest and the Pacific, uh, which seems like an odd combination. Um, but my mom is from Guam and my dad's from Northeast Iowa. And so we moved back and forth growing up. And uh, in terms of that legacy of the land, uh, both of my grandfathers were farmers. Uh, my dad's side, uh, my grandparents had a dairy farm in northeast Iowa. And then on Guam, my mom's father, um, he farmed, uh, which Guam is not a very big island, so not very many acres there, but he raised a lot of different uh, vegetables. And so uh, definitely had that legacy. I have uh, several relatives, including uh, uncles and cousins who are also in agriculture. So kind of that history within the family. Um, and then um, kind of inspired in me when I went to college, uh, passion in biology, and it eventually led me to working for NRCS um, and all of the work that we do in conservation. Uh, that's really where uh, my interest lies is in the conservation side of things. And, and what we're doing as an agency is conservation on agricultural uh, and other private lands. So a little bit about uh, who we are. 
as an agency, we're the primary federal agency authorized to work on private lands for conservation. We assist the landowners and producers out there. Um, for Wisconsin in particular, we have 53 service centers, um, but we have close to 3,000 service centers across the country. So wherever you're at, you can find an office and you can find NRCS staff who can provide you with some assistance. Everything that we do is working on a voluntary basis um, to provide those resources, whether it's technical expertise or financial assistance um, to the producers that we work with. We, again, it's pr voluntary conservation on private lands. Um, so across the country, that's 70% of the total land for us here in Wisconsin, that's 80% of the land. And again, it's one-on-one -on -one personalized advice. So we're out there um, here. You can see one of our soil conservationists here in Wisconsin working with a producer. Um, they're looking at some soils there with uh, checking out the roots and um, the soil health of that plant that they're looking at as a cover crop. Um, and we also help uh, with investments that producers want to make in their operations and in their local communities through our practices. <clears throat> and we do collect a lot of data. Um, and all of that data helps us to develop uh, technology and standards that can help the producers with um, the decisions that they're making on their farms. One of our uh, biggest priorities is working on soil health, and that's really looking at um, a suite of practices to help build the health of your soil, increase that organic matter, return some of the structural properties, um, help that uh, those critters that are in your soil that really help everything to be more productive. Um, so that's really been a focus of, of the agency since 20, uh, 2012. And uh, we've got practices on more than 40 million acres across the country. We also, um, as an agency, our foundation of what we do is all based on conservation planning. And so uh, what we do there is we meet with you as an individual. We talk about what your goals are. We'll walk your land with you. Um, we identify some resource concerns. So maybe you've got a few problem areas here and there, like invasive species, or maybe you have a goal where you want to have some additional pollinator habitat. Um, all of those different things are part of what we talk to you about. And at the end of the day, through that process, we can work with you to develop a conservation plan. And then through that conservation plan, you can look at implementing different practices that we might recommend, some of which you might want to do on your own, some you maybe you seek out different financial resources that might be available to help you with those practices. And so we have a whole suite of programs um, that are there and able to be able to provide that assistance. So, our conservation technical assistance program, that's where we do our conservation planning. Um, from 2014 through 2016, it was a $1.9 billion program. Um, we've, you know, through that, again, as I said, generating conservation plans and helping to uh, generate $3 billion in economic activity and supporting uh, 37,000 jobs across the country. And then we get into one of our um, programs that we have. It's called the Conservation Stewardship Program. And again, uh, nationally, we're, we're talking about uh, billions of dollars over multiple years of the Farm Bill. Um, in Wisconsin, last year, we had $18 million that we in, uh, used through the Conservation Stewardship Program on 120,000 acres. Um, so there's many different programs. This is a, a program that's really designed for if you're already doing some good conservation out there, this program can help you just further some of those practices a little bit more. We also have our EQIP, our Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Again, this program is really designed for those individual practices um, that you might want to implement that we would talk about through the conservation planning process. And then one other big program that we have here um, in Wisconsin in particular, there's a few other programs that are in different parts of the country. So depending on where you're at, I would encourage you to talk to your local NRCS office to see what might be available. But it's the Agricultural Conservation, Conservation Easement Program or ASEP. And this program has two different uh, pieces to it. We do uh, wetland restoration, and then we also do agricultural land easements where we um, basically help protect uh, lands that might be under threat of conversion out of agriculture to keep those lands as ag lands. 
I just wanted to share a couple of examples of some producers that we've worked with here in Wisconsin. This is Ingrid West. Uh, she's in uh, oh, Staten. Did I say that right? Boy, I'm, that's terrible. Um, anyways, Ingrid has, uh, she actually has 50 acres in Vernon County, Wisconsin, and uh, a forest land. And we've helped her through the EQIP program to do some forest trails and landings and some timber stand improvement and other practices. And she takes the logs from her forest land and she grows shiitake mushrooms with them. So this is just one example of how we've been able to help um, a producer here in, here in the state. And then this is Deidre Birmingham, and she is in the southwest part of the state uh, in Amherst, Wisconsin. She has an organic orchard, and uh, we've helped her out using equip practices um, for invasive species control. She's done some pollinator habitat, uh, seasonal high tunnel, and some other practices. Um, and then she's also uh, enrolled in our conservation stewardship program to really do some other things um, to help her out, like taking the prunings that she would be um, doing from her orchard and chipping those prunings rather than burning them. And then that gives her a mulch product that she can use somewhere else. So there's a lot of different things that we have going on. Um, I really went really fast through all of our programs. More information can be found on farmers.gov. Um, and uh, we have something new and exciting happening on farmers.gov. It's, uh, it's regularly being updated, but we also are now um, having an integrated portal where uh, producers can do all of their work online with us and, and things continue to be updated through that process. So if you're interested in or would like more information, I would be happy to answer any questions. Um, I think we're going to reserve questions until later on. Um, or if you wanted to type something in the chat, or you can always reach out to me uh, directly. Um, my email address is angela.biggs at usda.gov. Or again, as I said, we have field offices all over the country. So you can feel free to reach out to your local NRCS office. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Lisa. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Angela. So moving on, we have Jennifer Filipiak. She um, is with the Driftless Area Land Conservancy and another awesome champion for women landowners. Jennifer has done a lot of different things in the conservation realm and also working with American Farmland Trust and doing a lot of what it is that we are talking about right here of creating situations, mostly in the field, but hey, now virtual, of uh, getting women together to share best practices, to share where we want to go and how we can do that together. And one thing I'll give a shout out at the end, we have created some new resources for women landowners via Moses and our In Her Boots podcast. We are in the middle of a series featuring women landowners and agency women and different resources under this umbrella. And you can listen more to Jennifer on the uh, podcast that she recorded last week. And actually Deirdre Birmingham that Angela just mentioned was last week. So it's all connected and lots of good things. And take it away, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Unmute. Okay, you guys should be able to hear me, and hopefully you can see my screen. Um, Lisa asked that we give a personal introduction in the in the uh, spirit of the learning circles. We always try to introduce ourselves personally and professionally. So I just put a couple pictures together to be a little shot of my life here. I like to um, teach people about soil. This is my little nephew Henry on the on the left there. Um, I love to ride my mountain bike and also help maintain mountain bike trails, <laughs> uh, which includes invasive species control and all that good stuff. And that's a picture of my farm with a storm rolling in. Um, those of you who know Southwest Wisconsin, you'll know exactly where this is because that mound in the background to the right, on the front of that mound is the world's largest M. Um, if you are not familiar with Southwest Wisconsin, you should Google that. <laughs> there is a giant M on the back of that hill. But anyway, that's our little little farmette, and we're playing around trying to do some, trying to introduce rotational grazing on that field. But um, my connection to the land, um, it really started with my dad. It, my dad's a bow hunter. I grew up in Chicago, in, um, both city and suburbs, and um, my dad was a bow hunter. And I learned a lot about ecology and the circle of life, um, having to explain to my little friends why it's okay to eat Bambi. 
uh, not many of my friends in, high, in, in grade school were eating venison. <laughs> so, so I got a quick lesson on that um, from my dad. And it, it just really inspired a career of wildlife biology. I became a wildlife biologist. I became a deer biologist, actually. Um, I worked in the Chicago area. I got to work for the Forest Preserve Districts there in Lake County, Illinois, north of Chicago, um, which was pretty great because I grew up hunting for um, antler sheds in those forest preserves with my dad. Um, I got to move to Iowa with, uh, to pursue a job with the Nature Conservancy after that. And there I really learned about farmers' connection to the land and um, really was inspired with this incredible opportunity we have working with farmers and landowners. I learned also in Iowa that farmland is rented. I had no idea about that. <laughs> And that's where I got to meet uh, women landowners and where I kind of got started with all of this work um, and uh, eventually met Lisa and lots of the folks on this webinar through that, that connection. Um, I moved, uh, you know, met my husband there. I moved to Illinois and um, with him, he's a, uh, following his career, he's a um, professor of animal science and agriculture. And um, when I moved to Illinois, I ended up getting a job with American Farmland Trust. And, that was really, that was a regional job. I, I led their Midwest programs. Um, we ended up moving up here to Southwest Wisconsin for his job again. He teaches at UW Plantville. And at that point, I really found myself, I was working with all these amazing farmers and really great people, but all over the place, all over the Midwest. Um, and I really loved living here in the Driftless area. And I wanted to learn more about this area and meet my community here. And I wasn't because I was never here. I was always working in other places in the Midwest. Um, so when this job came along, um, I now am the executive director of the Driftless Area Land Conservancy. It was just this perfect blend of my career with conservation, with agriculture, my desire to be more connected to the land again, um, and to work with my, my own conservation, conservation community. Um, so that's kind of how I got here. Driftless Area Land Conservancy is, um, well, this is our mission. You know, we work on maintaining um, and enhancing the health, diversity, and beauty of Southwest Wisconsin's natural and agricultural landscapes. Um, we do lots of different programming. I'm not going to talk about all of it. I'm mostly going to talk about the land protection programming because that's a potential service that might be of interest to you all. Um, but we do a lot of educational programming and land management and restoration and that kind of that kind of work too. Um, I thought, well, first I should tell you, since not everyone here is from Wisconsin, that I don't know how, how familiar everyone is with the Driftless Area. We call ourselves the Driftless Area because this has to do with the fact that our region here in Southwest Wisconsin, Southeast Minnesota, Northeast Iowa, and Northwest Illinois, there's a whole area around the Mississippi River there that was not um, covered by glaciers in the last ice age. And because of that, the glaciers did not recede, flatten the landscape, and leave their glacial drift. So we are the driftless area. Um, and it's a very unique landscape. You can see a picture of a pine relic here. This is a really unique feature of the driftless area of Wisconsin. But it mainly has to do with the fact that um, it's, nothing's been flattened. So there's a lot of topography, steep forested ridges, deeply carved river valleys, spring-fed waterfalls, lots of trout streams. Um, so ecologically, it's a very unique place. And we are um, the, we like to say we are the land trust <laughs> where, that serves this particular corner of Wisconsin. Um, where there's a little bit of overlap with some other land trusts, but generally speaking, what a land trust is simply is, Driftless Area Land Conservancy is a 501c3 nonprofit. And a land trust is a nonprofit organization that has um, as part of its mission to actively protect land um, through conservation easements, which is an interesting tool um, that you can use to protect your land and, main, and keep your own ownership of the land. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in particular. Or land trusts also steward and manage land or conservation easements. So that's really all land trust is. It's a nonprofit that can do conservation easements. Um, the role of the land trust is to make sure that the restrictions that are described in conservation easements are actually carried out. Um, this requires at least annual monitoring of all of our easements. We have 48 easements in southwest Wisconsin right now covering almost 8,000 acres. Um, and then the really important part of this is having a really good relationship with the landowner because we don't own the land, we just um, hold the easement. We have a, an interest in the easement. And so we work with the landowners 
to help them manage their land, to help them keep up with the terms of their easement. Um, and if there's a potential down the road that there might be some legal action, then I, we, we, it's our responsibility to defend that easement um, in perpetuity. These easements are forever. So when the landowner that we originally worked with um, it passes the land down or passes away and passes it down to their family or sells the land, the easement stays with the land and Jerusalem Area Land Conservancy stays with the land. So we then forge a relationship with that new landowner too, to keep defending that easement. So it is forever, regardless of the land ownership. So let's talk about what an easement is. Briefly, you guys will probably have a lot of questions about this and I'm happy to answer them um, in whatever format works for us. Um, but a conservation easement is a voluntary agreement between a land trust and a private landowner. So what it does is it permanently restricts particular uses the most common things that are restricted by a conservation easement is splits. So if you were to sell the land, you have to sell it as one piece. It cannot be split up. Um, and then the other restriction that's very common is just, is, um, is basically no development. Um, but there's a lot of caveats that there's a lot of explanations there because you, some, often there's still a house there, there's ag uses, that kind of thing. You can define all of that in your easement. The easement is forever. Um, it's a permanent land protection tool, but the land stays in private ownership. And it's recorded with the deed, so it stays with the land. Um, so e if you're the landowner that puts this land under easement, even if you sell the land or you pass away and it goes to the next family member, the easement stays with the land. And it can have significant tax benefits. Um, and so most people want to do easements because one, it's part of their desire for their land they might you know they put this land together they took care of it and they want to they want to see it stay like it is stay stay protected and two those tax benefits are very real <laughs> so so that is a nice a nice benefit um you might hear the term and angela mentioned i'm glad you mentioned asap the agricultural conservation easement program so what's an agricultural conservation easement it's the same thing it's an easement it's a conservation easement but it allows for the use of agriculture. So what you're restricting is you might restrict development of that land, but you're gonna, but that's, but you can still allow for the use of agriculture. You're not restricting agriculture. So it's a great tool for protecting farmland um, and keeping farmland in farming. So another variation on this theme is this idea of purchasing the development rights of land. And so some people, you might actually hear that, and that's kind of that can happen too. It's the end result is the same as a donated conservation easement, which is what I described before, except in this situation, the landowner is entering into that easement with um, a land trust and often in partnership with a federal or state agency. And they're actually getting paid for the value of that easement. So they're actually selling the development rights. Um, but the legal structure is the same. It's a conservation easement. Um, your easement value is determined by appraisal. What's the land worth without restrictions versus what's it worth with restrictions? And that's the easement value, the difference of those two. The use is, when you use PDR, as people call it, in Wisconsin, we have a program called the Purchase of Agricultural Conservation Easement, the PACE program, it's the same thing. But the use of that is, there are some potential tax benefits, but they're not as great because you're not donating anything. Um, but a big thing, this is a tool that people don't often realize they could use in land transition. So you can use this as part of your planning, your succession planning, and you can put your farm in an easement um, and that could potentially reduce the tax burden, capital gains taxes, things like that, um, that you would talk through with your financial planner and, um, and your attorneys. But this can be a tool to make the farm um, either available to your heirs um, eat, eat more, more affordably or maybe you want your farm to be more accessible to beginning farmers. So your, your land is worth less if you don't have development rights. But that might be a great entree to help a beginning farmer access land more affordably. Um, also, when you buy, when you get paid for those easements, um, farmers, when they do this, they usually invest that money right back into their operation. So it's good for the community, it's good for them, it's good for agriculture. Um, so it's, and you're still protecting the land forever. So that's just a little bit about land protection. Um, if you're interested in this kind of a tool, or really if you have any more questions about everything we do, because I don't want to take up too much time. Um, if you want to protect your land, you want to learn more about conservation easements, find a land trust that serves your area. So Driftless Area Land Conservancy, we work in this corner of Southwest Wisconsin. Um, Groundswell Conservancy works in Dane County. Mississippi Valley Conservancy works along the Mississippi River. So there's lots of land trusts. And a great place to find a list of all of them is through the Land Trust Alliance. 
Another way to find out about how you can protect your land with these tools is to contact your county office. So in Wisconsin, our county offices go by lots of different names. <laughs> um, so, but there is a conservation, there's a county conservation department in your county and you can find it. There's a directory at this, um, what you're seeing on the screen here at wisconsinlandandwater.org. If you're not in Wisconsin, you just look for your soil water conservation district. Um, so that's how you can find out about these tools and how you can apply them to your land if you're interested. Um, there's my information if folks have more questions and I know we're gonna have a few minutes at the end um, to get questions from the chat. So thank you for your attention. Excellent, thank you, Jen. And we will, um, yeah, we have some questions for you, so we'll come back to those uh, yeah. after, after Gretchen and Julie with Pheasants Forever. Um, thanks again. So Pheasants Forever, you, wherever you may live in the, in the United States, there are Pheasants Forever folks to help. And these are the women who are truly the boots on the ground who come out and see your land and walk your land and can identify plants amazingly so and trees and everything in between but a great resource for again the conservation plans and that so we're going to talk a little bit from our wisconsin lens but the things that these ladies will be talking about are applicable wherever you might be and gretchen and julie take it away all right um okay so my name is gretchen skidlarczyk i am the pheasants forever farmville biologist for southeast wisconsin I'm um, just kind of thinking about my connection to the land. I don't have necessarily like what you'd think of a typical backstory. I grew up in the suburbs. I didn't grow up on a farm. Um, you know, neither of my parents or really anyone in my family, you know, hunted or fished or, you know, we didn't even really go camping. I did, you know, play outside, you know, so it's not like I was, <laughs> you know, bedridden or something. But um, those are kind of all experiences that I had to pursue kind of as an adult. Um, so um, I ended up going to the School of Natural Resources at the University of Michigan. Um, and then from there, um, I had to kind of seek out that elusive experience that apparently you need to have <laughs> to get a job and to get paid someday. Um, so I kind of worked all over the United States, um, getting just different experiences. And some of that was more like research-based, like, um, you know, doing plant surveys or something like that. And then also some of them were more like, here's a chainsaw and go out and cut down some trees or backpack sprayer and a little bit more um, getting your hands dirty type of work. Um, and then at the same time, I kind of um, really sought out those communities and people that um, were into like some of those outdoorsy things that I didn't experience when I was younger, like camping and um, hunting and um, hiking. I even took hunter safety when I was like 27 or 28, which was super interesting being kind of one of the only females in a group of mostly 12 year old boys. So just one of those experiences that you can, um, you know, fondly look back at um, later. But I guess, um, oh, I didn't change the slide. Um, the point of that all is that um, my connection with the land has kind of come from those experiences of, you know, whether it's that really steep learning curve when you first, you know, are doing your vegetable gardens, when you kill more things than you end up harvesting or I'm getting to see the sunrise with my husband um, in a deer blind at deer camp or seeing my first prairie planting come up that I got to plan myself. So all those things has really fostered um, what fuels my drive, I guess, behind doing conservation work and my connection. So Pheasants Forever in general, um, we started in 1982. Um, and it was basically a group of pheasant hunters who saw this connection between seeing, hey, we're not seeing as many pheasants on the landscape. And also there's this decline in habitat. Like we need to create an organization that addresses this issue. Um, and then since then our work and our mission quickly um, earned us this name of being the Habitat Organization, which is a nickname that we very proudly um, tote to this day. And Quail Forever sort of started in the same manner um, in 2005 as a response to um, decreases in quail population and habitat loss. Let's create an organization to do this, to do something about it. Uh, and so we sort of accomplish our mission through a few different ways, um, one through legislation efforts, um, 
through our chapters, through our Farmville Biologist program. Um, and there's something else, education and awareness. Um, so our chapters, we have a really unique chapter model, and that is that um, all the money that our chapters raise stays local. So we really get to decide where you wanna put your efforts um, and your money that you raise towards. So some of them do more like youth learn to, youth learn to hunt events, um, youth events, adopt a wildlife areas, um, lots of habitat projects, that sort of thing. Um, and across the nation, we have 700 chapters and in Wisconsin, we have about 30. And so one thing that Julie and I really wanted to highlight since we do have so many awesome women on the call is this new, newish initiative that we have at Pheasants Forever um, called Women on the Wing. And it's really a way to help um, inspire and provide opportunities for women to connect, to um, foster, and encourage each other to be better conservationists, sports, um, better sportswomen, and also to um, encourage a new generation of conservationists and sportswomen. So one of these ways is through our women chapters. We have two in Wisconsin, um, the Red Cedar Women, which is up in Dunn County, and our South, South Central Women's Chapter, which is broadly based in Madison, but kind of also surrounding areas. And they have the same kind of goals as the traditional chapters, but they, um, are mostly women anyways. Um, we also have our Pheasants Forever, um, our three events that we do, and that stands for like recruiting new hunters, retaining existing hunters, and reactivating hunters who maybe stopped, you know, used to hunt and then for whatever reason stopped and now um, kind of want to get back into the field. Um, this is really about providing opportunities for women to get together, get out in the field. Um, it can just be like clay shooting or um, you know, learn to hunt events or learn to fish events, or it can even be just like going out and let's, let's look for some wild mushrooms that we can harvest together. It's just a, a way for women to get out and get into the field um, and learn about habitat and conservation. Um, we also do these awesome conservation outreach events like we have today. Um, you know, we learn from uh, the Women, Food, and Agriculture Network's research that women really enjoy learning from each other. Um, especially in these sort of informal learning events. So um, we've been doing these Women Caring for the Land events um, in a few different states in Wisconsin. We, um, from 2017 from 2000 and 2019, we had 15 events that had 325 women. Um, and then this is along with Wisconsin Farmers Union and our, our awesome partners who have helped us put these together. Um, we did have to postpone our events from 2020 um, but we are doing them in 2021, so if you're interested, definitely, um, maybe we can include that in the resources, but it's a good time. There's usually a potluck, which is like the best food. Um, just a good way for us all to kind of get together. And then our last um, sort of women's programming thing that we do are, are these women wine and wild game events. We have wine, we have wild game, we have women, it's amazing. <laughs> um, and it's a really good way to um, get women that are interested more in maybe like the sustainable food aspect um, of, you know, hunting and conservation and um, kind of connect that with land stewardship and opportunities um, to hunt wild game. So now, Julie, I'll let you take it away. All right. All right. Um, so my name is Julie Peterson. I'm the Farmville biologist in the Green Bay area. Um, and I wanted to share this slide just to show how recently I've connected with the land. Um, but I feel very fortunate. I grew up in northern Minnesota hunting, fishing, um, co collecting wild rice, picking berries, growing vegetables, and you know really at a young age um, was connected to growing your own food, harvesting your own food, and taking care of the land. And so um, I, I just, you know, that start really um, spurred a connection to the land and encouraged me to be in wildlife biology and kind of go down the conservation end um, for a degree. And, um, and so I did that. And then, um, and like Gretchen did a whole bunch of different jobs, some in research. One of my jobs took me to Hawaii and I was banding little honey creepers 
birds and another job took me to the Apostle Islands. And then I landed with the DNR planting prairies. And I kind of fell in love with prairies and, and pollinator habitat and whatnot. But, um, and then I got this job with uh, Pheasants Forever and um, Nick and me, um, you know, married and we live in Green Bay currently and we own a farm up in Marinette County. Um, his father passed away a couple years ago and we bought slash inherited that farm. And so that's kind of the photos you see here, us and our family on the land. Um, we've, it's about a 200 acres, 100 tillable and 100 forested. And so we're slowly developing goals and um, taking, transitioning the land to be what we want it to be. And so, um, the bottom left is the two shysters I live with who, um, helped us to plant we're taking small fields that are not very productive um and we're putting them into pollinator habitat and so we this spring we planted a pollinator planting and after the pollinator planting the two boys decided that they needed to run around in the mud puddle um so that's what they're doing down there um but one thing that I think is really important to try to keep kids into conservation and connected is to involve them with projects. I know it's really hard sometimes, but involving kids with projects, I think, and, and uh, managing the land is really important. Um, and that's why conservation is important to me because I wanna see the land uh, for future generations so they can hunt and fish and so they have clean water and good soil health. So that's really my motivation to um, keep up the good fight, I guess you'd say, for conservation. So next. <laughs> Gretchen's sharing my slides, so. Oh, hi, Gretchen. <laughs> I'm not sure you can see the next slide or not. You might be able to, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about the Farm Bill Biologist Program. Can people see that slide? Yay, I can see it. I think we're good to go there. Um, thanks, Gretchen. So the Farm Bill Biologist Program, really, you know, as Gretchen said, PF's mission was to put habitat on the landscape. And so um, probably already 15 years ago, um, they developed the Farm Bill Biologist Program. Currently, Pheasants Forever has about 120 Farm Bill Biologists who work around the country with landowners to put more habitat on the landscape for pheasants and other wildlife species, but also good conservation on the landscape. And so we're private lands biologists that sit in USDA offices typically um, and help to deliver conservation through farm bill programs. Now, um, if you want to find your farm bill biologist to help you um, develop goals and or review your goals for your property, please visit our website um, and punch in your zip code and you can find a farm bill biologist by you. I'll speak a little bit more um, to the Wisconsin partnership because that's where, where we're at here. And um, you can see the um, map there. Um, I'm in the red area and covered the red area, but there's seven farm bill biologists across the state. And we are funded by the USDA, DNR, and local Pheasants Forever chapters. Um, and really, it's our goals to help landowners um, achieve their goals. And, you know, for folks who are looking for kind of like, where do I start? Contact a farm bill biologist, and they'll just really walk you through, you know, maybe developing your goals or reviewing your goals for your property, and then connecting you with local resources to achieve those goals. Um, next slide. And, you know, Angela um, did a great job with all those programs. And, yep, you know, these are just some of those federal programs that 
we work really closely with, um, and we work really closely with Angela's staff too. And it's, it's really rewarding to work in such a landscape with all different resource professionals who have so much knowledge um, and just are really great people to work with um, out there. So it's really, really good to work with NRCS and be in communication with them daily. But we also work with state programs too and um, help landowners to, to find those opportunities for their land. Okay. And lastly, you know, um, I wanted to just kind of share uh, a slide on the, you know, habitat that we're talking about um, when we talk about pheasant and quail habitat. So as you all know, nesting habitat um, across the, the landscape has declined. Pollinator, la pollinator habitat has declined. And here's just some of the, the uh, pictures of some of the projects that we've done um, with landowners. And you know, that's kind of where our passion lies is in you know, putting pollinator and prairie habitat on the landscape. But definitely we are um, available for folks and help landowners, um, you know, achieve their conservation goals. So the middle picture is pretty cool. Um, this is a landowner who was in the conservation reserve program. And after three years of um, his prairie planting, he sent me this picture and he's like, look what I saw on my CRP field. And so that's really rewarding to see that, you know, a landowner could be successful and he could actually see and grab a picture of wildlife using his, his property. So um, with that, I guess, you know, um, check out your farm bill biologists. They'll help you out um, to just a good first start, you know. Um, and you know, with that, I wanted to leave you with a quote. Um, and it's from a good conservationist friend down in the Southwest, um, Doug Durden is his name. And he always says, it's not our land, but it's our turn. And I really think that's an uh, important thing. It's not our land, but it's our turn to do good for the land. So thank you. Lisa, if you're talking, we can't hear you. <laughs> okay, now I think you can hear me. All right, we're figuring this new puppy out. Thank you, everybody. And most of all, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing ideas and resources. And um, Steph, if you can pull up my slides again there, um, we, can, we can keep rolling. Um, Excellent. So one thing you might have gotten the sense already from the story sharing aspect of what we're talking about is historically, pre-COVID, when we would do women landowner outreach, and this is something really important. I know we have a variety of educators on this call, too, who want to do more outreach to women, is to really embrace the fact that we, as women, learn differently, you know, and it doesn't always exactly fit traditional learning models. Uh, the research shows that women's preferred learning styles are learning from each other, a very collaborative setting, a very uh, holistic setting. So as you see here on the left, sometimes we have these women caring for the land circles. This was at our USDA office in, in Madison before, and we're always in a circle. I'm always rearranging chairs and tables wherever I go because historically things just aren't set up for that, right? We need to be lectured to or told how to do things and we really want to approach things differently with women landowners and women education in general because wherever you're on your journey and i know we have women looking for land on this call women who are new landowners to very seasoned is that we all have something to learn and we all have something to contribute and it's it's always so much better all around when we do it in that cooperative setting So a couple new resources I want to give a shout out to that we have 
created this year is the webinar we're talking about right now, and that will be also recorded. And we will send you all a, a follow up with resources and web links to all the things we've been talking about. I mentioned we have on our In Her Boots podcast series a special series right now for seven weeks of women landowners talking about what they've done on their land and various conservation resources. And then also on the resource note, we have created, there, there's I think three online right now and they're going to be peppered throughout the next couple of weeks of some women landowners at various stages as some are going back to their family land, like you see here with Patty Shevers, to looking for land, to reinventing land, but basically sharing their story and what their challenges are and what their barriers are. And then we have, actually, the, many of the women you saw on this call uh, coming in with question, with answers to questions and resources. So it's kind of an informal Q&A, but there's snapshots of women's situations that I think a lot of us can relate to. And those are easy uh, PDFs that you can download. And again, we'll send you all these links. Great. All right. And then uh, our In Her Boots events, I want to give a shout out to because, again, normally they are uh, in the field, on the farm, and we will be doing them virtual this year. And this gives us opportunity to take on some topics that we've been talking about a lot that we haven't really had a chance to explore. So we are doing this Resilience Boot Camp into July and August. It will focus on resilience. How can we, as a community of women dedicated to our land and sustainability and farming, uh, help each other, help each other keep at it and take care of that most important tool ourselves. And how can we uh, better manage our time, our resources, mental health issues, self-care, ergonomics. We're going to touch on it all. So there's a variety of resources under that. Again, we'll keep you posted. There's e-news and, and podcasts. And then we'll be doing a couple more of these sharing webinars as well. So keep you posted there. And we want to now open things up to questions. And I wanted to just kick things off because particularly a shout out for some of the newer women landowners on the call. We threw out a lot of resources here and I know a lot of uh, USDA acronyms, but Angela, if you could start us off, what would you advise as first steps for a new woman landowner? She loves her land, but doesn't know what's there and doesn't have, has a vision of wanting to steward it, but is in, search for a plan, what would be the best first step? And please others chime in. Sure, yeah, um, thanks Lisa. I would say that um, definitely one of the first steps would be to reach out to one of our offices, um, or as uh, both Julie and, and Gretchen mentioned, the Pheasants Forever biologists, um, they are working hand in hand with our staff and they can walk through that conservation planning process. Um, because really the first steps is getting a, a conservationist out there who can help you um, by walking that land with you and talking about what your goals are, uh, what are the things that you are concerned about, answering whatever questions you have, um, especially if you're a new landowner or a beginning farmer um, who is just looking for different resources, you might have a bunch of questions. Um, we can definitely be out there to pr help provide those resources. So. Uh, the Pheasants Forever biologists really focus more on the wildlife side of things or even some of our easements, um, whereas our soil conservationists uh, are really going to focus more on the agricultural production side of things in addition to all of the wildlife um, pieces. So um, I would say wherever you are in the country, um, whether you're here in Wisconsin or you're somewhere else, I would encourage you to reach out to um, our offices or the land conservation department staff here in Wisconsin or those soil and water conservation district staff in other states um, and those go by many other names too, natural resource conservation districts, etc. So there's conservation professionals out there in every county in the nation and we are ready and willing and able to walk that land with you and talk about what your concerns are and help you out. Terrific. Thanks, Angela. Any of the other panelists want to chime in? Okay, well, we're going to add some of these resources to it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. onward with the questions. Erin Schneider, who's been putting some stuff in the chat, Folks can see her. She's in her cute little farmhouse kitchen, and it's like 95 degrees here in Wisconsin. So, uh, yeah, come inside. She has some questions for beginning landowners and access. Um, so, Erin, why don't you shout them out? Thank you. 
Sure. Um, hi, folks. Thank you so much. Um, it's good to see familiar faces and, and new faces as well. Um, so I, I guess I have, I, um, first, I'm really just grateful for the programs you offer. Our farm has definitely benefited from conservation reserve programming and wildlife habitat incentive programming. And we're sort of in a place where we're thinking about how how do we like make this available to our next generation and, and just with uh, access and support. Um, and I guess my question would be in the spirit of collaboration, whether it's from each of your organizations you work with or people on this call, um, what am, I guess what am I trying to say? So it's more along the lines of knowing that ownership is, you know, in some cases, like, well, definitely a privilege and it, it's just our turn as, as Julie had mentioned. Um, how, how do we like help maybe the next generation of people wanting to access land through some of these shared conservation programs? And what can we do as women landowners who, who are in a position to, to help with that? Um, I'm just maybe for, as a way of example, we have CRP land. Um, what if we wanted to make that available in the rental agreement or like to sh share that cost savings onward? Or um, do you all provide technical assistance there? Or what would you recommend for, for how to frame those agreements? I don't know if that makes sense as a question. <laughs> I'm just curious more on your thoughts on like ways you're problem solving or thinking about how to make this accessible when you're not necessarily owning the land or you want to share it with someone who's not in an ownership position. Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, all of our programs are open to landowners and or operators or landowner operators, right? So um, with many of our programs, depending on the practice, especially if it's a permanent practice, a structural practice, um, we definitely want the landowners to be involved. Um, we also have different parts of our programs that are geared specifically to beginning farmers. Um, what we don't have specifically as NRCS is we don't have like an apprenticeship type program or um, it, we, we can connect folks who are interested with other resources out there. Um, like as an example, there's a, a dairy apprenticeship program. Um, there's other organizations and groups that um, are really working hard to try and make that connection with um, folks who, you know, the, the farmers who want to transition out of farming and maybe are looking to a newer farmer, somebody who wants to come in and continue farming that land, but they don't necessarily have family members that are interested in doing that, that they would be able to pass that land on to. There's a whole bunch of different resources out there. I know, um, here in Wisconsin, I think the uh, Wisconsin Department of Agricultural Trade and Consumer Protection, I think they've got a program, certainly through, I think through Extension, there's, there's a bunch of resources and we can, um, I think we can put those together and send them out to, have Lisa send them out with everything. Um, but there's different resources out there to be able to help folks that are interested in that. Um, I think Moses does something too, don't they, Lisa? Yeah, yeah, we can include all those links in the resources, excellent. and. Actually, I have another question for you, Angela, from Jessica Nelson, who it sounds like she had her first visit into the, she was very complimentary, the very, very nice folks in the NRCS office. But again, as you have been talking about, there's just a lot to process and mm -hmm. we're given, you know, a lot of pamphlets and brochures and all sorts of things. And maybe can you help advise us, how can we best prepare for our first connection with our local USDA office, both the NRCS, but they're usually housed with the FSA, the Farm Service Agency, and other conservationists. How can, how can we best prepare to get the help we need, or at least the best next steps before, sure. before just walking through the door? <laughs> yeah, so, and I know, um, I, well, I tell you, it's the federal government, right? So I think it's our <laughs> jobs to be complicated, <laughs> um, or at least that's certainly what Congress hands us. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, it's our job to help try and simplify those programs for, for the producers out there. Um, you all don't need to be experts in, um, you know, the program requirements, but what I think what would really be helpful is if you have an idea in mind, so you, you know your land, you know it better than we could ever know it, um, to know and understand what, what it is that you want to achieve out there. Is it that you have forest land and you're, you're not sure, but you're really interested in making sure you have 
um, good habitat. You'd like to be able to walk through it and hike through it, but it's just overgrown with all kinds of stuff. You don't even know what it is, but it's really hard to walk through. Um, maybe you're interested in, you know, how productive those trees are, or maybe you want more po pollinator habitat. Just what are the different things that you want to achieve on your land? If you have an idea along those lines, or if you know you're interested in farming and you've got a, a farm that's completely cropland acres, but you're really interested in grazing, to even know and understand that you have that kind of direction in mind, that is really helpful when you start that conversation with our conservation professionals because they can make sure that you're getting connected with the right resources, that you're um, learning about the programs that would help you. Um, but if we if we don't have that part to start with, if if you don't if you're really just getting started and you're not even sure exactly what you want to do out there, it's going to make it a little bit harder for us to be able to help you achieve your goals. Um, we can help you walk through that, um, but I would definitely say that, um, you know, that makes it more challenging for us and it's harder for our staff if you don't know. However, that doesn't mean we can't answer questions. We absolutely can. And so if there's something that you're, you know, you're overwhelmed with all the paperwork and all of the different pamphlets and brochures and information on programs, I would say go back to the basics. Don't look at all of that stuff and really go back to what are your goals, what are your conservation needs, and that goes back to the conservation planning that I started talking about. That's really the foundation of everything that you want to do, whether you're going to work with us and the federal programs, whether you're going to be working with the farm bill biologists and maybe looking at some of the state programs, whether you're going to go to Jen and talk about an easement. All of that starts with that foundation of the conservation plan. And all the way along, don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, the more questions you ask where you're confused about something, we really want to help you know and understand what it is that we're trying to share with you and make sure that you know and understand how these different programs and resources can help you with your goals. Because at the end of the day, that's why we're doing what we're doing. We want to help you with the land because you, you're the ones who have the land. Um, and we want to help you achieve those goals to help protect that land, to make sure it's there, those resources are there for future generations. Excellent. Perfect. And thank you. And on that note, we wanted to officially close at two and respect folks' time and folks who need to get back onto that hot field. But we are happy to hang on if there's other questions. And one thing we can try here now, so 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 please feel free to, to sign off at any time and um we will get a follow-up to you and look forward to seeing you at other other things like this that we'll be doing. And for folks who, particularly now, we'd like to move into if you have specific questions on your land, your region, um, feel, free, feel free to literally get into the weeds. What I think we can do is for those on Zoom, you can unmute yourself uh, as Erin just did, but should be, you should just be able to click on that and um, ask a question, or we can also feel free to put them in the chat. So on that note, um, I see a couple folks connecting to audio. And But in the meantime, and um, please, uh, Julie Gretchen and Jen, if you've got ideas, there's a question from Kristen Conley about the conservation plans and her wanting to get one and kind of trying to navigate the local office of USDA to, to develop one, but what bottom line are some suggestions in developing a conservation plan? And if you could even just first define what a conservation plan is <laughs> for those of us starting out. Maybe Julie or Gretchen, if you could take that one. I'll take it. Um, so a conservation plan is really um, IDing your goals and objectives and, uh, and putting together, you know, practices um, and with a timeline to achieve them. That's simply pretty much what a conservation plan is. So really IDing your resource concerns, IDing the goals you want to, to put on your, your land, and then, you know, putting forth kind of a, pl a plan to achieve them um, is a conservation plan. And, um, you know, my suggestion would be um, 
we have a Southwest Farm Bill biologist, Britta Peterson, um, and we could hook you up with her. And, and not sure where you're at, Kristen, with um, developing your goals, or maybe you already have them developed and you just need someone to help with the planning of it. But I think, um, you know, Britta can help out with that and, you know, maybe even do a site visit to, to see what you have going and kind of get an idea of what direction you want to go. And then she can connect you with others too that can help you achieve those goals. Good. All right. So I see a couple other folks connecting to audio. So give it a shout out if uh, other questions. Or the chat, or I um, would follow up on a couple things that Aaron had mentioned in the chat, and we kind of had talked Great. about um, real quick. She had talked about the landowner incentive program, and I, I don't know if she has used that at all. I I know a little bit about it because it's um, I've heard it before, but I've heard it being used in Southwest Wisconsin with um, the Department of Natural Resources and um, they tend to help landowners with habitat improvements um, specifically for certain species um, and whatnot. So um, Darcy Kind is the, I don't know if you're familiar with her, Erin, I think that she is still the, the representative for that program. Um, and we can hook, her, hook you up with her and she can you know, specifically speak to if that program would work for your property. And then I, yeah, <laughs> I also wanted to add to, you know, um, you kind of had mentioned like, where do I go um, with, you know, habitat improvement or not habitat improvement, but like, how do I share this, my land with others? And I know not everyone hunts um, and some folks don't like the idea of sharing their land openly with hunters or just bird watchers or other folks. But, you know, some people do and they want that connection with people and are open to that. And that's so awesome because I think there's a lot of hunters out there who are new hunters and don't have anywhere to go. And so if you would share your land and your ethic with them, that, that would be awesome. And, and there is a program through DNR, um, the Volunteer Habitat, uh, I don't remember the acronym. Maybe the Gretchen. Voluntary Public Access Program. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that that's a really good program for landowners to you know um, share their share their land with hunters, and um, it's a DNR DNR program. So. And then also through that program, there are some habitat incentive um, kind of cost sharing stuff that you can do through them. So that might be an option if you're looking to both share your land and get some, a little bit of extra funding for some of those habitat projects. Excellent. Did we have a couple of questions? I think, oh, I was oh, going to jump sorry. in. Um, yeah, this is Jen speaking, sorry. Um, in the chat, I think it, yeah, it was Kristen mentioned, um, yeah, that it was the Grant County NRCS office wasn't able to help her. Um, you know, I, I think one thing I just wanted to mention was with all of our programs, actually, it's not just NRCS, um, you know, conservation kind of gets the short shrift often <laughs> from, from a public money standpoint. Um, all of us, there is more demand if, to get help to do conservation on your land, to learn how to manage your land, to protect your land. Um, to work with your farmer to do in-field conservation practices, you know, there's more demand than there is uh, financial and technical assistance available. So I would just say, you know, let's just be upfront and let's be honest about that. It can be very hard to get the help that you need. And so my advice, and I've worked in three different states, it's like this everywhere, at least in the Midwest. I've worked in three different states in the Midwest, so <laughs> maybe California and New York are like no problem, but um, at least in the three states I've worked in, um, you know, just keep asking, um, you know, so the, in Grant County, you can ask your NRCS office, you can find out who's your, at your soil and water office, you can call me, 
You can call Mississippi Valley Conservancy. You can call Britta at the Pheasants Forever. You can call Darcy Kine. Uh, of those people, you know, someone, someone will have something for you. Someone will know where you can reach out next. Um, it might be that you have to kind of do things on your own and people might refer you to a really good website or a really good handbook that they've found or a neighboring landowner or a landowner in another in the neighboring county that would love to mentor you and help you do what you want on your land. Um, but, you know, Lisa always says we women, women especially are very good at networking. Um, you know, you, you ha it's hard. You have to be persistent um, and you have to use your networks. Um, but, you know, there's people out there that can help you. There's resources out there that can help you. But it's, it's often not just as simple as giving me a call or popping in your NRCS office. That's where you start. It's not often where you end. <laughs> so just to be very upfront about, about that. It, this isn't easy. Well, let me Terrific. just piggyback that a little bit too with, with what you're saying, Jen. I would say I'm in, in total agreement. Much as I would like to say I have enough staff in the state or that we as an agency have enough staff across the country to be able to provide that service to every single person. We, we really don't, um, we're limited. So part of that too might be just that you, maybe you need to be a little bit more persistent and go back more than one time so that they know that you really and truly want our assistance. Because sometimes, I, I hate to say it, but sometimes it is that you're added to the list of names of people that we need to reach back out to um, but others are, you know, further up the list. Squeaky or wheel. The other, yeah, the squeaky <laughs> wheel. I, I mean, I hate to say that, but we're in all honesty. But the other part of it, too, is I, I would say the more that you can have defined goals so that you know what it is that you're looking for, the more efficient our time yeah. can be as staff, and that will help us be able to help you. So if you're if you're really looking for... Um, so that's where I say it might take multiple trips too to say, okay, here's kind of what I'm interested, the big giant picture. And then we can maybe try and help focus in a little bit on some smaller pieces to um, bite off and work on. Um, because just because of the limited resources that we have uh, across the board with all conservation, all of the partnership um, and the staff time. Um, so that's another suggestion that I have. Excellent. Any other questions from folks, either in the chat or unmute? Yes, this is this is Erin again. I'm just curious and um, picking your big picture thinking strategy mind. Um, I know you all like work work on a watershed level and know that you know ball of focus is that you know, what we have in our backyards and very individual supportive. Where do you see or, or, or where, like, for example, like this network, Women Caring for the Land or other, you know, just how we can kind of do a more watershed level, like conservation support when you work with, you know, thinking yes, I'm my own individual, but is there a way that you can also facilitate supporting other people in, in your county, in your area, and how would, um, how would a landowner tap into that? So I'd, I'd love to take a first stab at that if I could. <laughs> um, so we have uh, definitely different watershed groups out there. Um, and certainly um, I'll put a plug in for DATCAP. Um, again, Wisconsin's Department of Agriculture. Um, they actually have a, a producer-led um, program, producer-led grant where the producer groups can come together and get funding to work on watershed level planning or different um, activities they want. Um, I would say to NRCS across the country, again, that's basically conservation planning, but rather than on your individual farm on that larger scale, we also can provide assistance with that. Um, the soil and water conservation districts, that's also something in, the, in, the, um, in our case here in Wisconsin, the Land County Conservation Department, they can assist with that. Um, so there's lots of different avenues out there. Um, I would encourage you to check and see if maybe something already exists where you're at. Um, there's all kinds of different watershed projects and focus areas, et cetera, across the country. So wherever you're located, whether you're here in Wisconsin or in another state, um, just do some checking around and see what you might be able to find. Otherwise, if nothing exists, if you get your group of neighbors together, you can start your own group. <laughs>
And I just wanted to add to, uh, we have 30 plus uh, Pheasants Forever chapters throughout Wisconsin and other states. And, you know, some of our, chap all of our chapters look different because they're local groups working to raise funds. But some chapters will help landowners um, burn their prairies. Um, and um, some chapters help landowners plant prairies. Some chap, you know, the chapters have a lot of different um, opportunities for landowners too. Not every county or every area has a chapter, but it's not it's not a bad idea to reach out to them and just you know kind of get to know know them and see you know how they can help you on your land too. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. A special shout out to these awesome resource women we had uh, here. And again, we'll get a follow up with links and more information to folks in touch and look forward to seeing you back in July and August when we'll be tackling a totally different topic of, again, resilience and caring for ourselves so we can care for the land. And a big thank you shout out to Stephanie Kaufman there at the most office holding up this ship literally as we all navigate the new virtual world. Have a Wonderful rest of your day, rest of your week, and uh, hey, happy early solstice. Thanks, everybody.